Hey everybody, back with another video. Uh, today's video is in the series of the HVAC. HVAC is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, I am going to start talking. Uh, I did kind of a preliminary video about HVAC, what it takes to be a installation tech, or, and kind of what the job entails and um, conditions you have to work in and, and that sort of stuff. But uh, we're going to get right in it. And I think uh, the best place to start is uh, with a residential gas-fired furnace. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is kind of draw a furnace and uh, start. we're going to start with the components. I think that's probably the best place to start. Uh, so bear with me. I'm a decent artist, but I'm not tremendously good. So uh, let's start with the body of the base of the furnace. The furnace is basically a rectangle box. And uh, in the lower box, we have our blower. And that blower is what forces our air, pushes the air around the house. Okay? Um, there is a motor in here, and that motor is uh, powers that fan. And notice how that notice how this uh, uh, blower looks. I'm going to draw a side view of that. Basically, it looks something like that. So just by looking at this, you would know that the rotation is this direction because the air gets sucked in through the side and blown out in this direction. And um, I can show you examples of this later when I have something to show you, but um, the, uh, the fins are shaped like this. They kind of scoop the air. They scoop the air and as, 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 it, as it scoops it from here, and actually throws it when it gets to the other side, like that. Sorry, that's not a great picture, but um, anyway. So this uh, will take the the air that is in the house, and it's called the return air. You typically would have a a furnace filter that would slip in there and that'd be like a one inch filter. So your air is coming in this direction. Let me actually do this a little different. The cold air is coming in that direction. Okay, <coughs> that's the blower. In this case, um, It's a little, it's a little off. It's a little off too. Geez, oh Pete's. My artistic ability just went to crap, I guess. Alright, so what you're gonna see, the, the this is the body of the furnace, the outdoor casing, and there's usually a top plate here. And uh, there are different furnaces, okay? There's different efficiency ratings. Back th now, this this style of furnace started somewhere in the probably about in the 50s. This 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 started out and, and this style of furnace, um, and it originally had a draft hood. Those furnaces were about 70 percent efficient. Um, 50s and 60s thereabouts. Because prior to that, we can get into those if anybody wants to, but uh, maybe we ought to talk about that. We'll talk about that on maybe one of the, the next video, maybe the evolution of, uh, of uh, furnaces. You know what? I'm going to do it in this video because we're better to start than the, the evolution of something. Um, this is kind of the present day furnace, and so let's stop here for just a second and go backwards. The very first furnaces besides fireplaces, obviously 
everybody can think back to the little house on the prairie and Laura Ingalls and Charles Ingalls and they split wood, stacked wood and filled it and you notice that they put that fireplace in the center of their cabin. Their bedroom was behind it, their kitchen and dining room was in front of it. They cooked off of it, they also used it to heat the house. And the way those worked is, they would heat up that large mass of rock and stone and that, would, that was a thermal mass. They would burn in there all day and all night and, and that would radiate heat from back behind in the bedroom. The heat rose, it went upstairs, it would radiate up in the, uh, up in the loft bedrooms. So that was kind of a, kind of a uh, convection slash radiant heat source. So that's one of the first um, forms of heat that uh, that was available. Then, so so then they uh, so then the next th the next step next the next heating appliance that was available after that was the cast iron cook stove, um, which they used to cook on. And, you know, it really technology in, in those appliances haven't changed much, um, except for the newer styles that they've they've uh, learned how to use. <clears throat> secondary uh, uh, air to uh, reburn the, uh, the the combustibles, the the, the smoke, if you will, uh, unburnt fuel rather than all the smoke went up chimney. They figured out how to reburn some of that. Um, and I actually I have a quadra fire uh, fireplace insert that I currently use today. Uh, uses new technology anyway. So if you think about like a uh, is a wood stove. You throw wood in it, heats up, thing gets smoking hot, you can cook on it and boil water and everything else. And same concept, just a little more efficient. You can control the airflow a little bit more. You can throttle down a damper on the stack, you can adjust the primary air, you get a little bit better efficiency burn. Okay, so and, and those are still around today, so not much has changed there. So then uh, they took the big metal cast iron vessels and they started to burn coal. Now, this was pre-electricity and this was just into, we're getting into the industrial, industrial revolution, we're getting into the coal furnaces and, and then soon we ain't got to gas yet, we're just still into coal. So what they would have is a thing called an octopus furnace and it's a big, um, it's a big round cast iron section built piece by piece. They start at the bottom and work their way up and it was nothing more than a really big wood stove. Same kind of <coughs> concept except for they would shovel coal into it. Um, the first ones were manual feed and again it had adjustable dampers and such and um, then, they, then the next stage on from that was automatic feeders so um, now, I don't know how it is in the rest of the country, but here in Michigan, uh, they would uh, have sections of a basement uh, dedicated as the coal bin. So the truck would back up in the driveway. There was, and they're still on, they're still on houses today. There was a cast iron door that the guy would open up. He'd put his chute in, and he would unload the truck, and the coal would go right in to the coal bin in the house and uh, either either the, the family would manually load the furnace with a shovel or it was uh, there was an automatic feeder that would basically a conveyor belt that would take that in there <coughs> and these were gravity fed furnaces meaning that there's no blower remember no electricity no blower so what would happen is this is a convection current the heat in the furnace would naturally start to obviously heat rises. If you if you want to see a, an example of that, boil water on your stove, the steam will rise. So heat rises. We pretty much all know that. So out of this furnace, the hot air is rising. Well, as the hot air rises and leaves, it's replaced with the cold air. So you get what's called a convection current. <coughs> The way these heat runs were set up 
was there was one big plenum on the top of the furnace and they had big 12 inch runs and they would go to just a couple of locations in the house uh, pretty much one in every room they would in the old days the supply registers would be in the interior of the house and the cold air returns would be towards the outside. Their thought there was that they would get a convection current inside the room. So let's say, I'm going to draw you real quick um, a picture of a living room. Okay. Now, let's say that you would just have a window. Oh, back 10 too. They had really big windows and that's because they didn't have electricity, so they needed to let a lot of light in. That's why you're ever looking around and you see the really tall windows. Um, they had to let the light in so they could see what they were doing. Anyway, <coughs> so in the interior of the room, let's say this is the interior and this is the exterior. So what they would do is there would be a register, a small register here, that would have let the heat come into the room. So this is the warm air coming up and they would put a um, somewhere on the exterior wall they would put a cold air register typically not in every room only a couple <clears throat> and they were very big so what happens is the warm air rises travels across and then the cold air it falls so you get a convection current happening in this in the room Nowadays, they don't do that. They, they do it in reverse. They force the hot air or the warm air up the outside walls and draw all the cold air in the inside walls. So it seems to work a little better that way. You get less, <coughs> more of an even heat. But in this case, when you had gravity, it worked great because the outside walls were already cold and you get that convection current. All right, so now we're, we're, uh, we're still on coal at the moment. So then, they, uh, they came up with gas. Gas was the newest, biggest, and next best thing. So they started to convert these old coal-powered, fired furnaces over to gas. Still, they were, um, um, there was no electricity, so they were, uh, they were powered by a thing called a power pile. Well, let's back up just a second and say they converted it over. So they would take the burner assembly and the rack and the shakers and the ash pan and they'd take all that out and they would install basically a burner. They would pipe the house with gas. <coughs> Typically, if you switched over and you got gas, you also got gas lights. And I've been in houses that still have the piping. However, they're not in use. But I've been in other houses doing remodels where I found black pipe, 3 8 black pipe in the wall where they had wall lamps. Um, I think if you want to see an example of this, you can look at some of the old movies. Like, for example, I think Gone with the Wind has gas lights. They had a gas chandelier. And they would have, um, uh, there was a gas valve in the middle of the chandelier. And it was piped and it would come out of the ceiling, the gas pipe would. It goes, all the chandelier was, was basically, it was just all tubing, and, and it was all gas. And the valve for it was on the bottom. So they would open the valve, they'd light all the lights, and that was their light. It was pretty cool. They also had, like I said, the wall lamps. <coughs> um, so they, they, would, they converted all the, all the, all the uh, octopus furnaces over to gas. Still using a convection current to uh, to heat the house and, and, and get the airflow to move. No electricity, remember. Okay, so if there's no electricity, then how 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 is the gas valve operating and, and things? And uh, that was that was done with a power pile. We can get into the different uh, pilot assemblies and such. And the only reason I'm covering this, uh, depending on what part of the country you live in, you may run across these. And I will tell you for a fact. Um, 
that these octopus furnaces are still out there. My father-in-law has one in one of his rental properties. He swears by it and by all rights. <coughs> the thing was put in in 1930-something, if not even maybe the 1920s. It was originally coal. It's been converted over to gas. It's been fixed a few times. Parts have been replaced, but it's still there, and it still works. It is the most inefficient dinosaur I've ever seen. But it still works. I go over there and fix it periodically, and the thing's still running. It's, it's amazing. Uh, he will never change that furnace. So, um, power piles. A power pile is a device that, when heated, produces a very small amount of voltage. And I believe, don't quote me on this, it's been a while since I've actually dealt with one, but I believe a power pile will produce about 750 millivolts, <coughs> which is um, 0.75 volts. So it's not even quite one volt. But uh, um, they actually make uh, uh, gas valves and thermostats that will operate off of millivoltage. And, uh, and that's how they got around it, the, the invention of the millivolt. And an ex a present-day example of that, of that would be kind of like a Peltier heater, if you've ever seen one of those. When you heat it up, it produces electricity. It's kind of the same concept, but just a little different. So you apply flame to this thing, and it, and it heats up and starts making electricity, and that's what they powered the whole system with. There's a thermostat upstairs. It was a mercury dial type thermostat, and, and some of these are still in use today. Uh, you want to get rid of them and recycle the mercury, if possible. <coughs> but um, um, the mercury dials thermostat called for heat. It would close the circuit, power pile would power the gas valve, boom, it would come on. And, uh, and if the pilot went out, uh, it just wouldn't make voltage and the gas valve wouldn't go on. However, there was no real safeties on the pilot light because the pilot light was a uh, tube that came off of the main line and it went down and it was a very small pilot. And uh, if it went out and, and you didn't have heat, you just go down and relight the pilot. Um, so, so the next step in this evolution of these furnaces was, well, now they got electricity. So let's put electricity in the mix with these things. So the houses were getting wired, and, and they were getting uh, what's called knob and tube. Oh, man, knob and tube. That's a, that is a headache of an electrical system if uh, I've ever seen it. But um, some of this knob and tube is still in play today. I used to own a house that was half knob and tube and, and twisted wires and push button switches, weird stuff. But um, and, and again, if you guys have any questions on anything I'm talking about, leave a comment down below. I'll get into more detail. Okay, so moving on. So we got electricity in the houses now. Um, and we've converted our coal furnaces over to gas furnaces. Um, what can we do? Oh, let's add a blower. Okay, great. So this is where we're going to add the blower. So what they would do is they'd cut a hole in the side of the casing of this big monster furnace and they'd put a blower in there and they instead of having the ductwork come down and just connect to the bottom of the old octopus furnace, they would, um, they would uh, connect it to the blower. So now they could force that air up there. Well, we just made all sorts of efficiency leaps by uh, uh, able to push more heat off of the, off of the furnace. So, so that was kind of the... Uh, um, the end of the, there's no more evolution to the octopus furnace after that step. And, and I need to say also that these octopus furnaces, if you ever, ever run across one, and the white flaky stuff, the, the wrap that you see on it, that's asbestos. Asbestos is bad stuff. Uh, stay away from it. Don't breathe it. If you have to touch it, Wet it down before you do anything with it. Asbestos is bad news. Um, mesothelioma, uh, my grandmother uh, died from it uh, working in, uh, in a plant or a machine shop. Um, she got it from work. Uh, you know, I was, as, as it, getting into this field, I worked on a lot of them, octopus furnaces I told you about, and uh, I was exposed to it. Um, <coughs> Nobody told me, and I didn't know what it was, and I was just doing my job. And um, so you—that's uh, another thing in, in this business, any any business really. Um, 
watch out for your safety because nobody else will. Okay, enough of that said. Um, so then, uh, the next thing that happened in these furnaces was that uh, they, they started to get more efficient and uh, they, they turned into this style here. And this would be the basic shape and look of any furnaces, but they changed a little bit. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw the center of this in the first style. Now, what they would have is the gas line would come in and it would go into a gas valve and that gas valve would then feed a couple of burners. The burners are ribbon style burners that go into the furnace like so. And the flame <coughs> would come out of the top of these of these burners. Okay? And to do a, a, a let's see if I can do a, a side view or an in view of what this would look like is you would have your, your burner, something like that, and it would go into a cavity, like so, and the cavity maybe even has some dimples or something in it to baffle plates, or maybe there's one at the top to slow all those flue gases down. So this would be an example, and the fire would be, you know, yay big, and it would heat up this, this heat exchanger, and it would recollect at the top. So the fire goes in here, it comes in, and it re all recollects at the top, and it goes back out. So let's do a side view. If you've got your burner, and then you got all your flames here, and the flames are going up, and you got the heat exchanger, it would recollect up here at the top, and all come back out the front. Okay? So the, that would come out the front. Let's see how am I going to try to draw this? So. The fire goes up, comes back out, and you, you've got this big metal vent. It might be, it might be six inch, seven inch, eight inch, something like that, where all of these burners, all these heat exchangers, recollect and it mixes with air. So, as a side view of this furnace, um, you've got the heat exchanger portion, and all, and then the collector box, right? Well, then you have this hood. So you've got your uh, you've got your burner here, all your fire, and there could be like I said four of these in a row, and so the flue gases all go up here, and then all goes out here, recollects. Well, then it goes out this this um, this vent right here, <coughs> and then this would get connected to a masonry chimney. So what happens is air goes up there, the flue gases go up there, and it all mixes together, and this is called an atmospheric vent appliance. And this was the first setup. A perfect example of this, if you don't have this style of furnace, this is where I say somewhere in the 50s, um, maybe the 60s, <clears throat> this style of furnace came out and they were about 70% efficient. Those furnaces, um, or an example of that would be a water heater. A standard natural gas water heater that vents with a metal pipe is going to have the same concept. There's a little Chinaman's cap kind of on the top of the water heater with a gap under it. And in between the two pipes that go up for your hot and your cold water, there is a draft hood. And the fire comes up through the center of the water heater, mixes with atmospheric air, and then it vents through a uh, uh, either a masonry chimney, which is brick um, or clay and, and block or whatever, and uh, or it vents up through what's called like a B vent type of uh, vent. And uh, B vent is a double wall <coughs> metal pipe. So that's that. Those were phased out. I've worked on a lot of those as I was coming up in this business, along with the along with the octopus furnaces. Um, but then, after the 70% efficient appliances, uh, you had the 80% series come into play. And that also vents with a metal pipe, okay? And it goes to a uh, masonry chimney, but now we have to start making some changes because flue gases and temperatures Boy, I don't know where to stop and start the next video, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the flue gases in 
this style of, of, of furnace is a lot hotter. Flue gases meaning everything, all the non-combustibles that's leaving the, the appliance and going up the chimney as, as exhaust. 70%, uh, so that means 30% of every bit of that fuel that was burned is going up the chimney as unburned fuel. And that is a greater temperature than say an 80, or we'll get into the 90% series, which it started out at 90, and now they're up to 96.6. .6. That's the highest that I know of appliance today. So when we go from the 70% to the 80%, the flue gas temperatures drop. If the flue gas temperatures drop, the I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this so you can understand it. If this is going outside to a masonry chimney, the masonry chimney is on the outside wall. That masonry chimney is cold in the wintertime. So when the appliance fires up, it has to heat up that block and it has to keep it dry. If you lower the stack temperature to, by 10% and now you've eliminated the drafting of the fresh air going up through the chimney to keep it dry because an 80% furnace, let me write this in here, this is 70% is a draft hood. Hood. Or atmospheric vent. 80% series started with an induced draft. Okay, the inducer draft motor is, and these 80% series furnaces are in play today. Let me redraw this top here. So, you still have the vent, but now instead of it being 6, 7, 8 inch like they used to be, because it took the flue gases and the atmospheric vent or, and, and used Conve of convection current um, to draw those flue gases out of the house or out of the appliance, now we're inducing the draft. So, just like this, there's a little bitty motor and that is shaped the same way. And that basically vents, it sucks, the flu the, it sucks those flue gases through here. And there's a series of now, what they did, rather than a ribbon style burner that just allows the flue gases to slowly rise with convection or lets the heat rise its, on its own, what they've done is they changed the burner style to what's called an in-shot. The in-shot burner is a burner that is uh, you got your, your you got your ga gas pipe manifold so the gas comes in goes through the gas valve gas valve now this will come down <coughs> and on, there's a pipe with a bunch of holes in it so here's your here's your gas pipe manifold with a hole drilled in it and there's an orifice in that orifice is a small hole this is what a side view of this pipe would look like right here. So there's a there's a burner here, there's a burner here. I'm just going to draw three of them for the purposes of this drawing. And what happens is when the gas valve opens, the gas comes out this hole, and this fan is drawing air through. So this will be fired basically a tube here, okay? And that shoots it into a, into, into a hole. So the fire goes through and gets sucked through the furnace. Now, here's the side view of the heat exchanger. So instead of the burner being on the bottom, now they're sealed like this. And the, and the flue gases, there's two pieces of metal that are stamped. And they are tubular. Okay, so it's kind of shaped like this. So this part 
is all flat and stamped together and there's rivets and whatever else holding the thing together. This part here, however, is it's kind of shaped like this. If you were to look at the heat exchanger from this angle, let's get rid of this. The heat exchanger now is shaped like this. You got uh, this section, okay? And that's this section, that's where the, the, the fire goes in and it travels through and then it comes out and gets recollected just like it did here to go up the up the chimney but it gets recollected into a collector box so this inducer motor is bolted to a collector box which is bolted here and then the inducer motor would be connected to it and then it exhausts the, the flue gases out sorry for the crude drawing but basically that's it in a nutshell now they did change the heat exchangers from this flat stamp style uh, to uh, they do use tubular style heat exchangers <clears throat> which is nothing more than some tubes that go in there, uh, stainless steel tubes. Um, so then the next evolution beyond this was the 90%. The 90% furnace is the same concept with one more added feature, is a secondary heat exchanger. The secondary heat exchanger's job is to draw even out more heat out of the flue gases before it leaves. That's where we're gaining another 10% of efficiency. The way that works is we have to add another heat exchanger, but where do we put it? So here's what happens. We have to reconfigure the furnace. We have to get rid of the inducer motor up here. And we're going to put the burners up here this time. So now the burners are located up here. These are called in shop burners. The inducer collector box is now down here. Here's your inducer. Okay. So what happens is the gas now comes into the top, or it might come in midway, and then there's a, there's, it comes in and there's a gas valve, and then it comes up like this. So now the flue gases are boom, they're going in through here, and they're going through tubular or heat exchanger type things down here, and then they get recollected in this collector box. Same concept, just upside down. It gets collected in this collector box, it goes through, excuse me, not this collector box, there is a collector box here. goes through this heat exchanger where all of the flue gases come out and then it goes out of that heat exchanger down and into another set of tubes which then goes through what looks basically like a car radiator. Little tubes, <clears throat> the whole unit is either made out of a high temperature plastic and or a um, uh, stainless steel. This is where you get condensation. A 90% furnace, anything in the 90% series is a, called a condensing appliance. That condensate is because you are drawing so much heat off of the flue gases that they start to condense. Now remember me talking about way back in when we were talking about these when you switched over that you, when you ran it into a masonry chimney on an outside wall, you can get con condensation and rot out your chimney. Um, I'll get back to this in a second with that issue. <clears throat> but uh, what we're going to deal here, deal here, uh, dealing with this one is is the condensate that's produced because we have the coldest air coming into the furnace, blowing across this this uh, this this radiator. Uh, heat exchanger first so that draws as much of the flue gases out of that as possible the rest of the of that heat is picked up off of this heat exchanger and then a the hot air is blown uh, and goes into the supply ductwork and plenum um, and throughout the distribution system wherever that might be whatever wherever it might head to so that is um, the 90 percent series but now we got condensation to deal with. <clears throat> condensation is uh, has to drain. So 
there is typically on this collector plate uh, at the lowest point somewhere to connect a, a drain tube. Okay, so then you would drain this into uh, some type of floor drain. You might put it into some type of uh, condensation pump that will then pump it out some other location. Maybe it pumps it back up to the ceiling over to a drain or a, or a, perhaps a, a wash basin of some sort or uh, something like that. And you cannot pump these outside because it is winter time and if you pump put this to the outside obviously the water is going to freeze. Okay, uh, the only th other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that now that we have heated, we've taken this flue gases, we've taken this heat out of it, we've taken this Excuse me, it's really not the same amount of BTUs, but if we send that up that chimney, what's going to happen is the flue gases are going to go, um, they're, they're a lot cooler. Um, and, and so what's going to happen is they're going to condense a lot easier on the sides or the walls of that masonry chimney. So to keep that dry and keep it warm, you have to decrease the size of the pipe. So the smaller the pipe gets, the faster the flue gases go, which means the least Less amount, less amount of time that it has to um, have heat transfer or conduction. We do not want it to lose its heat before it exits the, firm, the, the chimney. Um, so what happens is a lot of times you will install a uh, chimney liner along with um, your furnace so that you don't get that condensation. Um, and, and, uh, and rot out the chimney. Now, when you go from a 70 to a 90, well, depending on what your water heater is, it's all relative to the amount of BTUs going up your masonry fire chimney um, and the size and so on and so forth. Uh, there's uh, Z-Flex is a brand of chimney liner. There's Z-Flex charts out there that'll, that'll explain all this. And again, leave a comment if you want me to get further into that. Okay, um, so you know the 90, 90 percent to 96.6. Um, there's not a whole lot of difference except for just the pure engineering of the unit itself. Um, you can get into variable speed blowers. You can get into multiples. Most of them are multi-tap speed blowers, so that cooling has a higher speed than heating. So, uh, and that's because. Uh, cooling is heavier, cold air is heavier than warm air, so it's harder to push so they speed that blower up a little bit. Um, you, you, you might have multiple stage therm or uh, uh, gas valves where maybe it fires on low fire, then high fire. Um, you've got variable so that it throttles down and throttles up as far as inducers and, and, and um, um, a variable speed drive uh, blowers and and, and then there's a, a ton of accessories. You can have a regular one inch filter, you can have four inch filter, you can have electrostatic filter, you can have electronic filter, you can, you can have UV lights, you can put in humidifiers to help compensate or combat the, the dryness in the house and, and you can put in air conditioning, I've already mentioned that. Um, you can put in single stage, two stage cooling. Um, see what other options can you get with these things. Uh, um, condensate pumps and um, uh, ERVs. ERV is a, uh, is a uh, I won't even get into that unless somebody asks about it. Um, uh, it, it takes the stale old air, um, um, takes fresh air, brings it in, uh, it, it gets rid of the old stale air but it crisscrosses so it kind of uh, takes the heat back out of the air that's leaving as it brings the air in and, and it kind of crisscrosses through this really weird heat exchanger so it warms up or buffers that air, tempers the air before it comes into the house so you, you, you don't really lose everything you're extracting out of the house. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so then I guess if we're talking about you know the the furnaces. And we talked about the 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 dial, the mercury thermostats, and, and nowadays you can get thermostats 
that uh, will connect to your smartphone. So the you know things have come a long way. Well, I think that's a good spot to end this particular video. Um, pretty much a good overview of, of the furnaces, the evolutions, and, and the uh, um, how they kind of changed in efficiencies. Um, I didn't get into any of the operation that's in future videos. Uh, we'll get into the operation of all that. I will pick a furnace that we're going to use as a model and, uh, and use that and go through all of that. And I'll get one in here as a... Um, what am I trying to say as a, as, a, as a floor model so to speak or a, a lab uh, piece that we can work on and, and, uh, and, and, and do some testing and things of that sort of. Um, Alright well <coughs> HVAC you guys want to be installers or technicians uh, you stick with me by the time we get to the end of the series you guys are going to know hopefully everything I know. So subscribe Leave a comment, please, because that's how I'm going to know what you guys want to know. And uh, um, uh, like the video, and I'll see you all in the next video, and so on and so forth.